So far when we've talked about thermal energy being transferred, we focused in on just one object at a time. So we talked, for example, about an object that might be gaining some thermal energy. But we've ignored the fact that there must have been some other body that transferred that thermal energy to it. And we know that that body that did the transferring, it must have lost thermal energy. So one must gain while the other loses. Now we're going to focus in on trying to understand what's happening to both of those objects at once. In general, the laws of thermodynamics tell us that the transfer of thermal energy from one body to another always happens in one particular direction. Specifically, it always goes from the warmer body to the colder body. And that's because the warmer one has more thermal energy available to it, and the colder one has less thermal energy. And in general, thermodynamics always likes to transfer from something with more thermal energy to less, uh, to less thermal energy. We can also start to think about how things might mix together in terms of their final temperatures. And to try and understand the temperatures involved, we can start with a simple example. So if we mixed one liter of water that was at 60 degrees Celsius with a liter of water that was at 40 degrees Celsius, then of course we'll have two liters of water. The question is, what would their final temperature be? Now intuitively, you're probably thinking it might settle somewhere in between them. And in fact, if it's equal amounts of water, it should settle right in between them, right at 50 degrees Celsius. And in fact, that is what those two amounts of water would do when mixed together. They would settle to two liters of water at 50 degrees Celsius, right in the middle of the two temperatures. But the question is, would that work the same if it was water with liquid mercury or liquid mercury with some other substance entirely? Would all these same rules apply in terms of the temperatures? And in general, no, they don't. And that's because of things we've already talked about. The fact that different substances have different capacities to hold heat, meaning that some will rise to different temperatures than others because they can absorb thermal energy in different ways. And so we can't necessarily say that the temperatures will be a perfect balance between the two. We need to adapt a little bit different strategy. So rather than just comparing temperatures alone, let's try and think about something else we know about this situation. Well, remember that conservation of energy still applies even when it's thermal energy being transferred and not some other kind. So if the conservation of energy does apply in this situation, that means that any energy that is being lost by one body, well, it needed to go somewhere. It didn't just disappear. It went somewhere. It's the exact amount of energy that is gained by the other body. So whatever thermal energy is lost by one is the amount gained by the other. And even before we get into a real formula, we can write out this general word statement, that the amount of thermal energy lost by what I'm going to call object A is the amount of thermal energy gained by the other object, what I'll call object B. But remember, amounts of thermal energy being lost or gained, well, that's really heat being transferred. And we have a variable that we use to represent heat. We use a Q. And specifically in this case, I've used Q with an A to mean the heat transferred from object A, but because it's losing that energy, I've included a negative sign as well. Because remember, that negative sign is referring to a decrease in thermal energy, or a negative change in energy in this case. But if it's thermal energy being gained, well, again, I'll use QB to represent that, the thermal energy gained by object B, and I keep that positive because it actually is getting a positive increase in its energy. But we don't have to just leave it in the form negative Q equals positive Q. We can be more specific than that. In general, we know if we want to actually calculate the values of heat energy, well, if we were trying to calculate the amount that was lost by object A, we would take the mass of that object, we would multiply by its specific heat capacity, and we would multiply by how much change in temperature we observe just in object A. We can do the same thing for object B. Take its mass, multiply by its specific heat capacity, which might be different than object A, and multiply by its change in temperature as well. When we calculate those values, as long as the one that's losing the energy has a negative sign in front, those values are equal to one another. 
Now, typically, we don't actually leave it in that form, though. We do a little bit of a mathematical step, and we take this big negative term, keep it all together in one chunk, and add it to both sides of the equation. So that one side of the equation is 0, and both of these big chunks are then positive and together, all on the same side. So as a result, we end up with this final value, which is really a statement, as we said before, of conservation of energy. It's a way of saying that when I take the thermal energy gained by one and add it with the thermal energy lost by the other, I will get an overall change in energy of zero, because the actual energy has not completely disappeared and no new energy has popped up out of nowhere. It's just two different amounts that are canceling one another out, because one is gained and one is lost. If two substances um, that have different temperatures are left in contact with one another for long enough, they will eventually come to the same temperature. And when they're at the same temperature, we say that they're in thermal equilibrium with one another. That equilibrium just means that they are equal, equal in terms of their temperatures. And that can be a really useful fact if we're trying to solve problems related to changes in temperature because two bodies are in contact with one another. So let's take a look at this example and see how we can use some of those facts to help us out. We've got a cup that contains 255 grams of water at roughly room temperature, 21.6 degrees Celsius. And that's poured or emptied into another cup that has 407 grams of water, but it's much hotter water. It's at 63.8 degrees Celsius. Eventually, they will settle to some common final temperature. So we want to try and figure out what is that common final temperature that they will settle to. Now, we've got, obviously, some given and required information we need to write down. But in this case, I want to separate things out a little bit. And I'm going to call one of them cup A, or substance A, and the other one cup B. And I'm just going to use that to help me organize my variables a little bit better. So, for example, the mass of cup A, instead of just calling it M, I'm going to call it M with a little A. And that is 255 grams. But when I eventually use this in my formula, remember it's all going to be connected to joules. And joules don't have grams as part of the unit. Joules involve kilograms. So I'm actually going to call that 0 0.255 kilograms. C is the specific heat capacity, in this case, for water. And we've used that one before. It's 4184 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. Kind of running out of room there, but 4184 is the important number. And then the other piece of information we're given is a temperature for cup A. Now, specifically, that's an initial temperature. So normally, for an initial value of something, I put the little subscript 1. So I'm going to say T1 is the initial temperature. But there's a different initial temperature for the second substance, for substance B. So I'm actually going to call this T1A. In other words, the initial temperature of substance A. And that's 21.6 degrees Celsius. I can do some similar things for cup B. So the mass of cup B is 407 grams. So I'm going to call that 0 0.407 kilograms. A specific heat capacity is actually the same value, 4184 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. And now I'm going to say T1B. That's my way of saying the initial temperature of substance B. And in this case, it's 63.8 degrees Celsius. Now, in reality, we're asked to find the final temperature of the mixture. It's important to remember this fact, though, about thermal equilibrium. We're looking for a final temperature, so that's a T2. And you might ask yourself, OK, does that mean I'm looking for T2 of A or T2 of B? Am I looking for the final temperature of the first substance or the final temperature of the second substance? Well, you're actually looking for both at the same time, because you're looking for the common final temperature of both. So T2, the final temperature, is the same for both substances. T2 
So in reality, it's just T2 that we're looking for. We are trying to figure out what is T2 in this case. Now, I'm going to write mine below because this will involve a little bit of an expansion that will spread out along the page a little bit. So give yourself a lot of room. Just setting myself up here to give myself a lot of room. And now let's see how we could write this out. So in general, we have a formula that says that the mass of substance A multiplied by the specific heat capacity of substance A is really just also multiplied by the change in temperature. And when I add that to all of that same stuff for object B, it all equals zero. Now, what does this delta T really mean? Well, remember, it's a final temperature minus some initial temperature. So we can write this in a little bit more of an expanded way. Now I'm going to say it's T2, the final temperature, subtract the initial temperature of substance A. And I'm going to do a similar thing for B as well. So remember, T2 doesn't have a letter attached to it because it's the same regardless of whether we're thinking about substance A or substance B. But the initial temperature values are different. So now we can actually plug in all of the stuff that we know. The only thing that we don't know and the only thing we can't plug in is T2. And it just happens to appear in two different places, but that's OK. We can deal with that just like if you had two different terms in math class that had an x in them. You would just need to find a way to expand and eventually collect those like terms together and eventually solve for that one single variable. So we're going to try and solve for T2, and everything else is a number that could be plugged in. So rather than trying to do any rearranging right now, it might be a lot easier if we just start plugging in things that we know. So in this case, don't worry about the units because they're just going to get in the way. It's already going to be a bit of a long statement. But just follow along. All we're doing is filling in the things that we know. So 0.255 kilograms multiplied by 4184. And then that's all going to be multiplied by T2 minus 21.6. For all the stuff with B, that's 0 0.407, 4184. And now it's T2 minus 63.8. And all of that is still equal to 0. Now, I know that looks like a very giant, intimidating, impossible to solve equation. But that's because you're focusing at this point too much on the specific numbers involved and forgetting that all we really have here is one single variable we have to solve for. It just happens to appear in two different places. But everything else is just numbers that we can work with. So there's a few different ways you could approach it from here. My particular approach is to first multiply these numbers together. And in the other B term, you do a similar thing, multiply those numbers together. And then once you come up with some common value for this entire thing, take that common value and expand it into this bracket. So multiply it by T2 and multiply it by negative 21.6. Then do a similar thing over here where once you come up with some common value for multiplying these, expand that value by multiplying it by each piece inside of that bracket. So when I multiply the 0 0.255 by 41.84, I get about 1,066.92. And then I'm going to multiply that by T2, by my final temperature. And I'm also going to multiply it by negative 21.6. So I get minus 
2305.472. And now I'm going to do something very similar for the stuff for object B. So when I multiply the 0.407 times 4184, I get 1702.89. Which I then multiply by T2, and I also multiply by negative 63.8. When I do that part, I get negative 108644.25, and all of that is equal to zero. Now, again, looks like I haven't really made things a lot simpler because we've still got these great big long numbers and that can be really intimidating. It looks like this impossible to solve equation. But just because these are great big long numbers doesn't mean they're any more complicated than any others. You can still use your calculator for any of the tricky stuff involved. You just need to focus in on what are my solving strategies. So in this case, that's the variable I'm looking for, T2. But right now, it's appearing in two different places. So I need to collect these like terms. I need to combine this entire term with this entire term. And separately, I need to combine this term with this term. My terms that do not have a T2 attached will also be combined separately. Not only that, when I combine these together, I'm going to also move them to the other side. So they are both going to get moved over to the other side of the equation. So now when I collect my T2 terms, the things that are attached to my T2, I'll keep them on the left and I get 2769.81. And on the other side, when I move both of those other terms over and combine them, I get 131. 689.7. Now I can finish it off just by dividing both sides by 2769.81, because that will get T2 all by itself on the left side. So those now cancel out. T2 is all by itself. And when I do all that, I get 47.544 and then some other stuff, but really approximately to two significant digits. Actually, in this case, I can round to three significant digits. I will round it to 47.5 degrees Celsius. So the common final temperature when those two amounts of water are left together for long enough, they will settle to a final temperature of 47.5 degrees. I'll go over this example in a little bit more detail in class and answer any questions you might have about the math process that we used to find it.